My name is Becky Senf, and I'm the chief curator at the Center for Creative Photography in Tucson, Arizona. I'm, oh, thank you, Bill. <laughs> Uh, I'm very pleased to be here to launch the Living Room Programs, and uh, this is a new collaboration between Unseen and the Center for Creative Photography. It's a program that's based on a, uh, a program that we actually have at the Phoenix Art Museum, a, a coll another collaborative partner of the Center for Creative Photography. It's a seven-year-old program in which each year we invite a different speaker to come and give a presentation which we call the 10 most exciting photographers I learned about this year. And the idea is that the speaker can only choose artists that they have known of for less than 12 months. And it's a very, um, it's a very casual, a very informal way to present new work and a way for the audience to get a sense of how uh, curators and uh, gallerists and publishers are getting exposure to new artists. And so uh, that program that we do in Phoenix was uh, shared with Unseen through Bill Hunt, who was one of the speakers in our program in Phoenix. And Unseen liked the idea and created this program. So each morning, this morning, tomorrow morning, and Sunday morning, two speakers will each present five artists that they've discovered in the last year. And so I'm beginning, um, and after my five artists, we will hear from Simon Karstetter, and I'll introduce him before he, he presents his artists, and then at the end we'll have a few minutes for questions. So to give you just a little bit about me, my name again is Becky Senf. I'm the chief curator at the Center for Creative Photography in Tucson. We're an organization that collects artist archives as well as a fine print collection. So we have the archives of Ansel Adams, Edward Weston, um, Robert Heineken, W. Eugene Smith, Harry Callahan, Aaron Siskind, the fashion photographer Louise Dahl Wolf, and, and many others. Um, I'm responsible for curating shows uh, in Tucson as well as at the Phoenix Art Museum. I've done projects on photographers like Richard Avedon, Edward Weston. I am an Ansel Adams scholar. I also work with contemporary photographers, including Mark Klett and Byron Wolf. And my most recent project, um, is this publication with Radius Books on the artist Betsy Schneider. It's her Guggenheim work. She did a project in which she photographed 250 13-year-olds and did video interviews with each of them. And so this is a brand new publication, not yet available, um, but it includes photographs of all 250 of the 13-year-olds that she included in the project. And then at the back of the book is a little um, insert booklet that includes quotations from the video interview interviews with the 13-year-olds. So that's a little bit about me. But we should go ahead and get started. Oh, there. That's who I am. <laughs> and what I'm going to do, I'll go through my artists. And at the very end, I have a slide that gives each of their names so that if you want to keep a list of the, the artists who I present, you can take a picture with your cell phone of, of my last slide. So without further ado. Um, the first artist that I'd like to present is Ward Long. And Ward Long is a photographer who submitted work to a, a juried competition um, for which I was one of three jurors. And that was the first place that I was introduced to his work. Subsequently, uh, he submitted work to the Houston Center for Photography Members Show, for which I was also a juror. And I was able to award Ward Long one of the top three honors and cash awards as part of that HC. CP exhibition. His project is called Stranger Come Home. And it's a series of pictures. It includes landscapes, portraits, still lives. Um, and each of the pictures works together uh, to create something of a narrative, although not a very specific narrative, a, a much more general narrative. And the work is about the process for the photographer of overcoming the grief of losing a love relationship. And I have a little quote. He says, in the aftermath of a breakup, I sold all my furniture, shoved my books in storage, and left the city. I ran for months on end. 
and I visited my parents and old friends. Staring at their front doors, living room walls, and kitchen counters, I saw signs of the settled comfort that I so desperately missed. Homes have a way of holding on. If you live in a place long enough, your belongings say something about your hopes and your past. If you live with a partner, the shared space sings of the habits, routines, and rhythms of your relationship. When it's over, the house remembers your old dreams. With every cup in the cupboard, every book on the shelf, it reminds you of what was and what could have been. One of the things that I think is important for curators to acknowledge is the ways in which our personal lives absolutely inform the way that we connect with art and, and artists. Um, I am myself recently broken up. I um, was married for 17 years with my husband for 20 years, and I'm now about a year and a half out of that uh, very long-term relationship. We have two children, my, my ex and I, and so I think that when I encountered this work, it had special resonance for me because I could identify with what it feels like to be on the other side of a relationship and to be looking at the traces of that relationship, but also understanding that it's completely in your past. It's something that, that you've let go of and has gone by. Part of the reason I think that I respond so strongly as well to Ward Long's work is that he's a very strong picture maker. And for me, I like a, a, a rigorous intellectual underpinning for the work, but to me, the images have to be strong and compelling or, I, or I'm not engaged. So to me, the, the power and the composition, I find he has an incredibly sophisticated and very refined palette that informs the work and helps hold all of the pictures together. The second artist that I'm gonna speak about is named Carrie Weirs. She's a young American photographer, and I first learned of her work when I was doing graduate student critiques at Arizona State University, which is in Tempe, Arizona, just outside of Phoenix. And one of their faculty members invited me to participate in graduate student critiques. Her project is called SHOT. So what we're looking at here are two tintype portraits. Um, Arizona State University has a very strong program in alternative processes, and so the students are all exposed to historic processes and, and making collodion, whether it's on glass or on tin. They learn salt printing and naturally cyanotype and platinum printing, but there's a very, a very strong thread of alt process photographers. <clears throat> so, what Carrie does is she goes out to the desert in places where people go out and, and target practice, shoot, shoot guns. She gets there early, she sets up her darkroom tent and gets all of her chemistry ready, and then when the first person arrives to go out and do their target shooting, she asks them if they would allow her to make their portrait. And so she makes these portraits of these mostly men who are out in the desert to shoot guns. Um, and then part of her process is then she offers that completed tintype portrait, that indexical object that represents the person, back to them to shoot at as a target. And so what we're seeing here are the portraits that have now been shot through by the person whose portrait it is. I have to say, when I first encountered these objects in the, in the um, critique, the graduate student critique, I was really very powerfully affected by the idea that someone would shoot through their own portrait. I mean, when you look at this picture of the man on the right with a hole through his own head that was inflicted by himself, I was, I was I mean, just very disturbed, very unsettled by this process. And I said, don't, don't these men understand that they're shooting at 
themselves. And she said they don't seem to be, they don't seem to think of it that way. Of course, as a photo historian, I have a long training of thinking of the photographic object as, as that indexical um, you know, representation of the person. But she said, really, they felt like it, it was a challenge. It was a, it was a toy. It was a, something to practice shooting at. And these are people who, very, um, who have a lot of pleasure in this process of going out into the desert and shooting. Arizona has one of the most unrestrictive gun laws in all of the United States. Um, people over the age of 21 are allowed to carry guns, both concealed or um, unconcealed, without, without a permit. So there's a very large gun culture in Arizona. And part of what attracted Carrie to this project was her own discomfort with how prevalent guns were, how popular, how um, enthusiastic people were about guns. And what she found as she made these portraits was how open the people were to talking to her. And that um, she was able to share her discomfort and her anxiety about guns and gun culture and people were willing to listen to her. And obviously they disagreed, they had different points of view, different perspectives, but she was really um, very honored the way in which she was able to collaborate and partner with these, again, mostly men, to make their portraits and have them engage with them in this way. And what we're seeing here on the right is a detail of the image on the left where you can see the kind of violence and damage that the, the bullets do as they move through that tin plate, um, aluminum plate of the tin type. The next photographer I want to speak about is Emmanuel Fructus. And I learned of her work uh, at last year's Perry Photo, so the 2016 Perry Photo. And these are collages, very large scale collages that are made out of vernacular portraits. So here's an image of the works installed in the, in the booth at Perry Photo. Uh, the, the gallery that shows the work is based in Lyon, and it's the Gallery Le Reverberé. And so for over 10 years, Emmanuelle has been collecting vernacular portraits. She finds them at garage sales and flea markets and antique shops and through things like eBay online. And so what we're seeing here are the overall collages, and next I'm going to show you a detail. So each one of those little figures, those little lines in the larger collage, is a person cut from a vernacular photograph. And so it's an actual collage. They're not electronically cut from their originals. They are by hand with an exacto blade, cut out of their original context, and rearranged in little groups onto these raised cards. And then all of these different cards are brought together to create the overall larger piece. So it's almost as if she's creating new families out of all the little people that she cuts out. She has a, a, a set of conditions that she needs for each figure to meet in order to use it in the, in the collage. So she's looking for people who are in focus. She wants them to be over six and a half centimeters high. She needs to be able to cut them out so they need to not be overlapping with something else. And she wants them for them to have empty hands, not holding something. In some instances, like with this collage, she creates a gradation. So you can see here that all the figures at the top are dressed in dark clothing. And as they move down, they are in lighter clothing so that there's an overall effect in the collage. This is another larger example with that same gradation effect throughout the, the collage. So they have this all over quality as well as having this incredible, I'm going to show you a detail, incredible detail.
detail. I mean, you can get your nose right up to the plexiglass and look at each of these individual figures and see what they're wearing, see their facial characteristics, their body language, and within a little panel, each of the figures might be a very different scale so that, you know, a man might be much smaller than the child, the giant child standing next to him. So you get these slippages and, and discomfort between the various members of these new family groups. Here's another detail. They're largely historic photographs, as you can see, black and white vernacular pictures, so including um, probably to the early 20th century through the mid 20th century. And then in some cases, she, she works very slowly. It's a very laborious process to meticulously cut each of these figures out of their original photographs and reassemble them into these large collages. So she may only produce, you know, it may take her several months to produce a single work. Um, so at one point she did a series, so this one is entitled Femme. And there's another one that's entitled Enfant and one titled Homme. And so she's got one that's all men, one that is all women, and one that is all children, so that together they make this very massive family group. So here's the one called Enfant. And then you'll see some details. Her name is Emmanuel Fructus. Fructus. And so it's, it's as if we're getting to go through all of these bins of vernacular photographs, except she has distilled them into these new works that bring together all of the, the beautiful uh, details of the clothing and, and all of the different people into a single artwork. So the next artist I want to show you is Tanya Marcuse, and Tanya Marcuse is an American photographer, and I first learned of her work when I was visiting a collector's home in New York City, and um, for those of you who've done that, visited a collector's home, you know that process where you go in and you're seeing often dozens of works that you've never seen before by photographers you've never heard of before. And um, sometimes I take notes, but oftentimes I, I try and just remember in my head the names of photographers as we go along. Um, and then when I leave their home, I go and I sit down on a bench outside and I try and rapidly scribble down as many names as I can. You know, I sort of walk myself back through their house and, and remember what I saw. Um, but so this was a work um, by Tanya Marcuse that really blew me away. Um, and so when I wrote my notes, this is what I wrote. It looks like a giant compost pile that is eggshells, bugs, a snake weaving through it, rodent feet poking out, really incredible. So. Um, they have this all over quality, like a Jackson Pollock, right? The, the, the pattern that is very hard to discern, but they're massive pictures, uh, probably 60 by 90 inches, something like that. Um, and so you can, again, get up very close and all of these details begin to emerge out of the all over pattern of information. And so this is actually the way she presents the work on the website. You can see the picture of the overall work and then she gives you these little details and you can see up at the top in the middle, she says which piece it's details of. And you know there are fruit, there are flowers, and I've got quite a number of these, so I'll, I'll go through them for you. Personally, I have such a, a love affair with my own compost pile. 
I, it's, I know it sounds totally wacky, but every day when I go out and I dump the eggshells and the ends of the asparagus and the celery and the cucumbers and the, you know, all the little bits and parts, and I see the way that the food that's there, I live in Arizona, it's very hot. So in the heat, you know, the food all, it turns black and it, it sinks down into the earth. And that whole process is very very visually pleasurable for me. Um, and so I think something about these works really connects with that interest that I have in admiring my compost pile. <laughs> um, so she actually creates these in her backyard. She lays out a huge big area and begins to arrange the fruit and the flowers and the plants. Um, and I don't, I don't know that we've seen one, although we'll, we'll come up on one. Um, that has details of animals. So here, this is a, a little bird's nest with little unformed birds in it. They have, they have a kind of sinister quality when you get up into the details um, and, and you begin to sense that these are these have this kind of balance between uh, growth and decay, between life and death, that they are very much about this cycle of things coming into flower or into fruit, but also that they have to pass through that process into rotting and decay. One of the articles that I read about her um, likened the work to that of Hieronymus Bosch, having that kind of dark, sinister, um, you know, puzzling, upsetting nature to it. So here's one with here's one with a snake. And it, it's the kind of thing, I'm going to go back one, that when you're looking at the overall thing, those details really are not very apparent. You have to have the, the individual details. Tanya Marcuse, of the photographers in my um, presentation, is probably the most uh, well-known, the most accomplished. She teaches at Bard College in upstate New York. And I thought the, the group of exhibitions that she had was really interesting. She's had uh, solo shows at Julie Saul Gallery in New York City, at the Francis Lehman Loeb Art Center at Vassar College, at the Davison Art Center at the Wesleyan, and her work was featured in an exhibition called Dress Codes, the Third Triennial of Photography and Video at the ICP, International Center for Photography, in a show called Heroines at the Thyssen Museum in Madrid, and in a show called Love and War at the Museum of the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. So this one has all of these um, animals with antlers where, again, See, it's, I, I mean, I don't know if it's a deer or an elk or something. Um, but for me, these ones with the animals embedded are, are quite interesting and poignant in that, to me, they feel like they're about um, the ways in which we often disregard the value of life and particularly put ourselves as humans at the top of this uh, food chain and then, and then disregard everything below us as if, as if they have no value. Okay, my final artist is uh, Raquel Fernandez Pascual. And Raquel is a teacher at the ESDIR School of Design in La Rioja in Spain. And this is work that I first encountered um, when I was jurying at Photo España in May. And the project is called Renaissance Collection. And um, this is the kind of environment where I could present work like this because I don't feel like I, you know, this is not, um, this is not work that I would normally show or include in an exhibition. It's 
very strange and very wonderful. And it's the thing from that particular jurying experience that I kept thinking about. This isn't one that we chose, uh, the jury. But so what, what this is, um, Raquel worked with the Department of Fashion at the school. And so the fashion students designed these costumes based on Renaissance paintings, but using <laughs> non-traditional fashion materials. So um, you can see in this case they use ceramics, plastic soldiers, and polyester fabric. And so there's a, a real silliness and playfulness, even though the photographs re reflect a kind of seriousness and poise and posture. So here's another one of them. And for the next couple, I'm going to give you the Renaissance painting that it relates to. So here you see the, the new photograph and the original Renaissance painting. And again, the Renaissance painting was the inspiration both for the, the clothing, but then the photographer also took that into consideration as she made her new work. Here's another one. And then with its comparative Renaissance painting. This one has um, bicycle tires, is the main portion of the jacket that the man wears. And here is its uh, original Renaissance painting. And so, I mean, as I said, I, I love presentations like this for the opportunity to, to show something work like this that is so unrelated to what I normally work with and, and think about. But as I said, it really s stuck with me, the creativeness and the inventiveness and, and the playfulness and the sense of humor. And um, they're really, um, they have this anachronistic play that I really appreciate. And I like the way in which the creative work of the students gets so beautifully featured in these pictures. So that, um, you know, of course you can have a, a, a fashion show where people walk the runway, but then this creates a permanent and lasting presentation of these garments as well. Okay, so here's my slide with all of the names. So if you want to pull out your cell phone and take a picture, mm -hmm. I, I realize I probably should have just created a handout, but this way you'll all have it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And, and now we get part two. Oh, let's see. That's still me. Still me. Do we have another um, PowerPoint here for Simon? Okay, well, while our technical component gets worked out, I'm gonna give you Simon's introduction. So um, next we're gonna hear from Simon Karstetter. Um, Simon is an artist, a musician, a cultural entrepreneur who lives and works in Munich and in Augsburg, Germany. He uses photography, drawing, printmaking, performance, music, and sound in his work. He's interested in subjects such as technology, time, society, and relationship. His practice addresses shifting perceptions of authorship, de- and recontextualization of images, appropriation, artistic approaches to photography and photographic archives, and remix and sampling as, as forms of art. He is a founder and one of the artistic directors of the internationally renowned organization for contemporary photography, Der Greif, as well as a co-founder of the interdisciplinary artist collective, Studio Furio, that unites dance, theater, music, and media art. 
Together with Leon Kirschlechner, he gives workshops at internationally known universities and institutions. And I want to tell you just a little bit about Dirk Reif. That you can find them here in the co-op section of Unseen, um, and they're having a great fair, and uh, things are going like gangbusters, so you need to get over there to see his project before it sells out, which it's going to do today. Um, Der Greif is an award-winning organization for contemporary photography. It is print publication, online publication, curatorial team, and joint project all at once. The artistic core and root of the project is the ad-free print publication. It combines and presents the work of photographers and authors of different origins in a holistic piece of art. The website is exhibition, communication, and information platform for participants and anyone interested in contemporary photography. Participating artists are presented in special artist features where they are given the opportunity to blog. In the section called Guest Room, outstanding personalities in the field of international photography curate and select their favorite submissions online. Der Greif connects the digital and the analog, exploring and expanding the borders and limits of image distribution and reception in the digital era. All Der Greif projects connect virtual, physical, and or print spaces. Der Greif has worked with institutions such as FOAM, Aperture Foundation, CO Berlin, Photo Museum Winterthur, and published works from about a thousand photographers and artists in printed publications as well as online. Please join me in welcoming Simon. So you're all set. That's your clicker. Thank you, Becky, and uh, thanks for coming. Um, Becky already made this rather long introduction of myself. Um, I'd like to point out again uh, to the co-op project as um, it kind of uh, reflects also the practice of that, that underlies Der Greif, because Der Greif is also an important uh, part of where I um, encounter a lot of new artists, because all of our projects are submission-based, so we receive thousands of submissions for both online and print projects, and uh, this gives me this great opportunity to look at uh, great work. But I'm going to present work of five artists, um, that I've encountered recently, both through submissions that we received for Der Greif. Um, the three artists that I encountered through these submissions are all presented uh, in our recent, uh, also anniversary issue number 10, because we, it's, it, this year it's uh, the 10th anniversary of, of the project Der Greif. And there's two other artists that I encountered through uh, other occasions, and um, yeah, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. Um, first, I want to talk about the work of uh, Fiona Strungmann. Fiona um, is born in 1986. She lives and works uh, in Munich and Berlin. Um, the work that I want to present uh, is entitled Just Like You, But Different. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about how we met and how I got to um, know her work. So um, Fiona and I met uh, early this year um, in Munich at a tech conference um, because I was invited there to, to do a publication for this conference. And Fiona, um, I mean, it's very, it's this very high tech uh, conference about, you know, like startup founders from all the big uh, startups that everybody talks about. Um, to AI and whatever is kind of um, up and coming in tech. And Fiona was there taking pictures for, um, for that book. And she had this uh, very old uh, Polaroid, ca sorry, Polaroid camera. Maybe I put it a little bit down. Do, do you still hear me? Okay, um, and I found it uh, very, very nice to have this kind of contrast, you know, be between all these high-tech objects and high-tech people and this very uh, kind of anachronistic uh, tool to, to take pictures. Um, and so some of her pictures ended up in this, in this book that we created uh, for the conference. And uh, Fiona and I got fr became friends. And... Um, yeah, she's 
one of the very few uh, photo artist friends that are also based in Munich because there's not such a big scene there and so I'm always happy to meet her at her studio and um, the work that she's uh, showing she's uh, that I'm going to present she's also showing it at I AI gallery uh, down uh, at the at the fair and I really recommend uh, you having a look it's still a work in progress and um, what she writes uh, about herself is that her work is best present represented in her photographic works and drawings on paper. From afar, her photo photography reads more as drawings and her pointillistic drawings as photography. So um, now I'm going to show you some images from Just Like You, but different. Um, the project sources um, from an archive of around 7,000 photographs um, that a woman had been collecting over a duration of 50 years. And uh, Fiona got in, uh, kind of stumbled upon this collection and uh, purchased it. What? What's going on? I'm sorry, I don't know what, what, what happens. Um, and uh, so she... Um, this, this archive um, is, uh, c consists of 7,000 photographs that a woman had been collecting uh, over a duration of 50 years. And um, uh, what Fiona told me when starting to look uh, through all these uh, single images um, is she developed an interest in selecting photographs from this ar archive and reframed them um, and what she did is, uh, through a chemical process, she isolated the respective elements within each image, as you can see um, on these slides. And I really enjoy looking at these, again, decontextualized images, um, and how this work, for me, has this kind of meta layer that makes you realize you're looking at a paper object that has been turned into a singular, non-reproducible, Usable work, so she kind of creates unique pieces, and um, I really like that he, that the way she reframes the content. Uh, it, you really get to see sometimes details that you might not even look at if, if you would see the entire uh, entire image if it would still exist. And so it for me it reflects about you know the passing of time. Plus again she's also kind of you know, reframing it in, in terms of, you know, the memories these images um, evoke within herself because uh, maybe also an important information is that uh, the archive traces back to images from the early 20th century until uh, like early 50s. So it's like a, some kind of a, um, yeah, an archive that, that uh, gives a frame of, you know, over two world wars and um, how, you know, how kind of uh, traditions have changed within this period of time, how um, fashion has changed, how people, um, yeah, kind of, uh, how that, that entire uh, time frame um, that she sources from now uh, can also be used to, to tell new and different stories. And this is, uh, yeah, this is what she does in her project, just like you, but different. There's also an artist uh, publication that she produced uh, for the occasion of, of Unseen. Uh, so really, uh, if you have time, uh, go take a look at AI Gallery and see for yourself, because it's also beautifully presented. I, I can present it that beautifully here uh, on screen. So it's also about the, the objects and how they're, uh, how they're presented. So uh, you should go and take a look for yourself. She sometimes also adds things, not only removes, but sometimes also adds things to the images. Uh, as you can see here, these kind of uh, small dots that also reflect the way she's doing these pointillistic drawings where she basically uses a needle to paint. So you, uh, you can only see it when you kind of move the paper 
um, to the light. And as you uh, you probably have noticed, it's it's really nice and delicate how you can see also because sometimes the 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 pieces, I mean most of the pieces are quite small, so you can see brush strokes and you can actually really encounter the way she uh, engaged uh, physically with these with these objects. Um, the next photographer that I want to present uh, is Luke Withers. His work wireless. And um, Luke is born in 1994. He lives and works uh, in Belfast and graduated from the documentary photography course at the University of South Wales with first class honors. And I came across Luke's work due to my friend Salvatore Vitale from Yet magazine, um, who selected Luke's work for a Source magazine graduates in 2017. And afterwards, um, I stumbled upon it again because of Luke submitting precisely this work to Issue 10. And one of these images is uh, published in Issue 10 and, and is also part of this uh, thread count project that we do in at Co-op. And um, wireless um, is um, a, well, basically takes. Um, the year 90, uh, 1897 as a starting point. Um, that year, the first wireless signal was successfully transmitted across a body of water from Flatholm, Flatholm Island in the Bristol Channel to Lavernock Point on the Welsh coast. This transmission marked the beginning of the Victorian communication revolution that arguably ca catapulted the world towards globalization. So um, Becky already also anticipated my interest in how images circulate nowadays. So um, I mean, they mostly circulate in form of data um, that often is transmitted wirelessly. Um, so Luke's work with the same title struck, struck my interest, and um, I like the, that the images are particularly otherworldly in a certain way for me. And um, I'm really kind of, how can I say, I really like that this, uh, this, this work, you know, has this very um, actual um, kind of relation towards what, what is happening now, but it really um, reflects to, to the very start of when uh, wireless signals uh, were transmitted first. So there is um, amateur radio enthusiasts that still today experiment from the same two points. They uh, transgressing the obstacle of the sea with equipment almost unchanged from those early tests. And um, what Luke says, they display an innate human desire to connect and communicate. And I guess this is also something that we can, that we all kind of know uh, within like uh, the, the last 10 years when the first uh, iPhone came about and since then how our ways of, of interacting and communicating and uh, kind of connecting with people has changed drastically. So I've, I like this kind of, you know, um, uh, seesaw thing that you have uh, tracing back to, uh, the, to the end of the 19th century until now. and. Um, yeah, that's uh, the, this desire is more visible than ever in our in interconnected world, and um, I don't know, but for me also this kind of uh, constant constant availability uh, reveals sometimes some kind of a loss uh, of connection to physical worlds, or it it can mean that. But I guess everybody uh, who has a smartphone sometimes encounters, you know, if you if you're at, a, at uh, if you're riding the subway. And you're just uh, looking around and seeing people staring in their in their screens. It's uh, yeah, it's it's very interesting, and that you know these people today, that the the people the work is about today still use exactly kind of the same uh, technique or kind of the same material that they uh, used to have um, when they started transmitting the first wireless signals.
the next if I go too quick through the slides you just have to say stop or anything I don't know if you want to look take a look at some images a little longer uh, the next person um, I want to present is Yannicke Stelling I'm going to show two works uh, which is stages on the one hand and voyeuristic neighborhood a new work also work in progress and um, she's also one of the photographers, photogra photography artists um, that I came across uh, due to her submissions for the Greif. She's already been part of issue 7 and she now is part with stages, with one images of stages um, of issue 10. She's born in 1986, lives and works in Berlin. And um, she now studies uh, visual communication at uh, University of the Arts Berlin um, in the class of von Sigmann. So I think within her work you'll, you'll also see this very graphic approach that uh, some photographers have and um, that reflects also I think in, in her not studying photography but visual communication at a graphic designer. And um, so Stages. Stages is a series of images showing an artistic confrontation with Cape Town 27 years after the separation of the races. And um, within this series, it's a rather uh, small series, it consists of, of, of 10 images. Um, I, the, this is the, the image that is also uh, part of issue 10 and when I saw these pictures I, they have some, also this kind of otherworldly atmosphere which is due to uh, Yannicke uh, cleaning up the photographs for example by giving houses a new coat of paint through digital manipulations. And um, I think this is a, you know, the, it has this very contemporary uh, color palette that she that she's using, you know, high contrast, very strong colors, and um, and for me that I don't know, it's it's kind of a reflection also to um, the way we encounter or like the way we encounter colors and surfaces on screens. This very, you know, kind of you know, maybe polished and distant kind of thing. And she contrasts these, uh, these images, um, like as you can see here, it's very about the, you know, space and uh, the spaces that, that um, develop through her very graphically reframing or re recoloring uh, the spaces there. And it really gives, like with this Cape Town light, that, that we all know from fashion photography, uh, this very unique uh, light, light. It gives this very kind of, I don't know, weird and, and otherworldly, as I said, uh, look to the series. And um, so the other project that, I, that I'm going to show, or that, I, that I'm going to show and talk a little bit about is Voyeuristic Neighborhood. And um, I said that for me the, the, the series stages has this kind of distance and um, I think she kind of continues with this, uh, with this exploration within a uh, voyeuristic neighborhood, uh, like addressing the, the, this distance. Um, it's voyeuristic neighborhood is a visual world created from real as well as fictional places and persons which represent the basic feeling of today's voyeurism to some, some extent as Yannicke says and again at the beginning for me they seem to be very kind of normal or kind of uh, yeah already seen but in terms of the light the sequencing and that, again, in this entire uh, framework that she gives in terms of, you know, our voyeurism, we want to know, uh, we want to both communicate anything about us in terms of, you know, what we eat, where we sleep, where we, uh, what we do, and we want to know that much about others due to, um, but in a very distant way, I think, because that most, in, most, most of the times that happens on whatever, Facebook, Instagram, wherever. And um, it gives us maybe this notion of knowing somebody, but as a matter of fact, we we not really don't because it's re we, we we really don't or just know some 
some of the people, um, like I'm, I'm talking about really knowing them. And um, yeah, it, it, it has this, again, in terms of, you know, the feeling that it evokes for me, it has this kind of very, it seems to be normal, but it has this kind of, oh, this kind of weird twist. Pablo Lauf, um, the next photographer uh, that I want to present to you. Um, I, uh, well, first, uh, some words about him. Um, he was born in 1989 in Munich and lives and works in Berlin now. And um, he graduated from Ostkreuz Schule in October 2016 under the special guidance of Werner Mahler. And when I first met I, we met through a mutual friend, Gita Cooper van Ingen, who is also the creative director of Tech Drive. And um, at that time, I didn't even know that he's he's a photographer because we met and we kind of immediately connected due to our mutual interest in music because Pablo is also a musician. And um, we were listening to music and found common ground there. And um, after that, we coincidence, uh, coincidentally uh, met a couple of times and then Pablo told me about uh, him being a photographer, like a trained photographer and also about him overseeing a program at um, Hebel am Ufer. Um, it's the biggest um, kind of off theater in Germany and uh, the program is um, it's, a, it's a residency in Berlin and they invite musicians from Pakistan to, to do this residency, to come to Berlin, to make work there. And um, meanwhile, they send Berlin-based musicians to Pakistan. So it's kind of this really exchange program that Pablo oversees. And due to this work, so his connection to music and musicians, he got to travel uh, to, um, uh, yeah, he got to travel to, to Pakistan. And this is where his work, um, Birds of Karachi, um, has been created over the past two years, I think, and I'm going to show um, some 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 images from this series. Um, and this this work deals with a self-aware and oppositional scene of young artists that are based in Karachi, a city of about 23.5 million inhabitants. Um, I actually didn't know that it was that big, but it's qu quite impressive, I think. And uh, these individuals. Um, advocate values like freedom of opinion and religion, freedom of the press, artistic freedom, sexual self-determination and equal rights. And um, Pablo, due to, like, you know, due to his uh, connection to, to the local scene, because of this uh, program that he, that he runs at, at HAO, at Heblam Ufa, he was able to really find people that he could, uh, that he could follow and really meet them on a personal level and basically document their lives within a very, you know, kind of rigid, uh, 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 country, which, uh, which Pakistan unfortunately still is. So they ha really have to fight for, for what, their freedom, for their freedom of expression. And, um, for me, it, it was really, powerful to see you know these very young individuals um, trying to find their own voice and um, kind of advocate it even though they might face repression they might get into danger and just because they they feel like I yeah well we need to do it we we don't have any excuse we we can't um, uh, we can't do anything but kind of do what we what we feel is necessary, um, even if we live or as we live in a in a very uh, kind of oppressive uh, situation. And this work uh, will be shown at the 60th anniversary of Goethe Institute in Pakistan. Tanya Franco Klein is the last photographer that I'm going to present. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, her work, Our Life. Um, 
Tanya is born in 1990 and she lives and works in London where she graduated from uh, LCC with an MA. Before um, she uh, she studied, she's, she's uh, initially from Mexico and she studied architecture in Mexico City. Um, she writes about herself uh, that she is highly influenced by her fascination with social behavior and contemporary practices such as leisure, consumption, media overstimulation, eternal youth and the American dream in the Western world. Um, again, this is work that I came across uh, due to her submissions for our issue 10. And um, the series uses very sim cinematogra cinematographic stage scenes that evoke a mood of isolation, desperation, vanishing and anxiety. Um, the naked baby that we just saw, I was and still am very fascinated uh, with, I don't know, with this kind of, you know, very isolated, as I, as I just said, uh, individual, very, very young uh, person, uh, like that, that, uh, that baby that, I don't know, seems kind of frozen and is looking at the, at the ceiling of the car as if there would be something. So again, and plus the light, the scenery, I mean, this, this kind of very cinematographic uh, light and see, uh, scenery is gonna, it's like a, a uh, a string that goes through the entire series and um, this strange almost Lynch-esque feeling that is constant um, uh, is something that I don't know I, I really like looking at this at these at these images um, Tanya also points out um, her influence by philosopher Byung Chul Han that some of you might know uh, he's a very kind of well-renowned German philosopher who says that we live in an era of exhaustion and fatigue caused by an in incessant compulsion to perform. We have left behind the immuno immun immunological era and now experience the neural era characterized by neuropsychiatric diseases such as depression, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, burnout syndrome and bipolar disorder. So it's kind of very dark how she um, frames that, that uh, series of images. And um, oftentimes she herself appears uh, in the images. So kind of she performs for them. And um, yeah, it's it's uh, as I said, I mean, very also constant in terms of, you know, this, like the entire uh, situation that you, that you see, it's, it's very, uh, very well executed as I think. Yeah, that's it from my side. Thanks for listening. And, um, <laughs> I think, yeah, I think uh, Becky's going to rejoin me because if there is anybody having any questions or wants to know something, that's, you that's can ask now. Now's your chance. <laughs> So no questions? Everything clear? <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you if you want me to do so, I will. Um, Simon, tell me. I, I heard you, I got you. So, so Bill, for the ones who didn't uh, uh, hear, Bill Hunt wants me to talk about this project we have at Co-op. Co um, the project deals again about the circulation of images. We have invited 24 photographers that are published in issue 10 with their single image to invite another photographer, artist, friend, whoever, to react visually to their image. So there's 24 threads of eight images as like chain letter reactions that we collected online. We now printed them on A5 postcards with an addition of 25 each. And you as visitors are invited to come, uh, basically get your uh, desired image or your desired thread of image uh, for um, two euros per card. 
So you were coming, removing the images that are now physically present, and while removing, there's a corresponding website that counts down the images. So um, the idea is to to think about you know the the popularity of images, but in, in a kind of reverse way as it, as, it, as it would happen online. So the most popular images will be the ones that disappear first. And they disappear both in the, in the physical space here at Co-op, plus online. And I guess it's uh, now, you know, talking about it rather uh, theoretical. If you're interested, go take a look. As Becky already mentioned, uh, there selling quick and we might be sold out today so all the cards or at least some of the cards might be gone by today so yeah i kindly invite you to come by our booth at co-op and take a look and ask questions so all right becky <laughs> oh sorry uh Yeah, no. I, I can okay. hear you when the mic's not on. Uh, I would like to uh, ask you about Emmanuel Fructus, uh, because I am very much interested in her work. Okay. Yeah. Very, very, ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was curious about the fact that she put in the same frame uh, different size of people. I guess it is a choice because it's repeated. Can you, do you know why? Can you explain uh, why, why these wha side, in the same frame you have a large figure and a small one and in a very... Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it comes from the practice of cutting them from all different kinds of vernacular pictures. Um, I don't know what her artistic motive for having the people all different sizes is, except to me, it sort of underscores the um, the disparate sources of all of these images and the and the disparate people, right? That they're you know that we're all such different people, and then she's uniting them into this single artwork. But they've but it's like. I mean, I think of it like a party, right? Like she had this party and she invited all of these hundreds of people to the party, but they're all very different. But I mean, I mean that's just speculative. I haven't met her, so I haven't had a chance to talk to her about the work. Yeah. Uh-huh. She could have put together the same size. size. But no, that's she right. she chosen not to do that. So right. I was no. if it was a question of perspective or whatever. right no that's an interesting point yeah she could have easily once she cut out all those little figures she could have lined them up by size right and had groups that were all the same scale yeah like yes right no yeah i don't know yeah i would like to thank you both for sharing your excitement thanks so much <laughs>